On today's episode, we review Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> oh, wait, no. Not that's that the one. That's, yeah. a, that's the wrong one. Oh, Circa 1972. <laughs> Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to another episode of Comic Movie Master List from Hit the Boots Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Chris Holcomb. And I'm Emery Saunders. <laughs> and here we are. Once again. To give you the third comic book movie review for the Comic Movie Master List. The third one. The third. We have a new contender. Uh, as our current standings are holding, <laughs> Batman 1966 mm-hmm. is uh, narrowly holding <laughs> the top spot between... The, the margin is so small. <laughs> and most of that margin is Emery. <laughs> <laughs> Literally lifting this thing on my back. I am the atlas of this movie being number, number one. <laughs> uh, the other one being, of course, Superman and the Mole Men. Um, let's check our scores here. So the average score for Batman 1966 was a C plus again, <laughs> largely <laughs> on the back of Emery. Yep. And then, uh, <laughs> Superman, the mole man averaged out to a D plus as far as our rating system goes for the comic movie master list. Our new movie, of course, if you've been paying attention to our social media is tales from the crypt circa 1972, which is actually a British film based on the uh, EC Comics title of the same name. Um, Kind of ironically, uh, Tales from the Crypt hadn't been produced in over a decade when this movie (laughs) was produced. Yeah. So it was very interesting uh, and probably explains on why they were able to get it so cheap. Uh, We'll get more into that later when we talk about the history of this movie. Uh, I feel it's probably a movie not a lot of people have a a lot of familiarity with. Uh, A, it was a British film. You know, um, of course, a lot of things get sent overseas like James Bond and um, Monty Python and stuff from that era. But generally speaking, for whatever reason, it didn't seem to cross the ocean. This is certainly the first time I watched these films. I was aware they existed, but I never even, even thought to bother to you know give them a watch see how they were yeah but uh i I gotta say i actually enjoyed myself quite a bit watching this movie and kind of familiarizing myself with the history of both ec comics and the tales from the crypt series uh both of which i you know i knew about but i never really dove into as a comic book of course and uh definitely not um the the comic company ec comics because all they were really known for was mad magazine once everything else got kind of killed by the comics code which is oh again a very interesting story uh i'm sure infamous comics code yeah it's they did them dirty they did them them real dirty and if you want to put on your tinfoil conspiracy hat there might be more to it than meets the eye um Hold on, I forgot to bring my aluminum. It's a really interesting history. I, we probably won't go too deep into it. I'm thinking about starting like a history of series for different things, you know, in comic books history. Yeah. Um, so I might save it for something like that, and I think this might even be a really good starting point hmm. if uh, I put that together. But uh, we'll see. It, again, it all it's all dictated by time. Um, uh, if you noticed last week, we didn't have a an episode again because we're in quarantine. There's no comics coming out. And there's not really a ton of news beyond, you know, depressing stuff. We wanted to focus on getting this episode and this review done. So uh, this is what you're getting this week. Uh, We will get more regular episodes going again, closer to the new releases actually coming out. Because we felt like we we were just constantly talking about releases that weren't actually coming out (laughs) and still haven't come out um, just because of the Diamond uh, shutting down issue. Yeah. Uh, so anyone wondering uh, what books we're hitting up this week, uh, the answer is none. <laughs> yeah. Now, DC is releasing a, a small handful via mail-in, but a lot of retailers aren't even participating in that because they want to support Diamond and make sure Diamond can get back on its feet. And uh, if you have the time, I really highly recommend you go listen to the latest uh, Fat Man on Batman episode where they actually interview the founder and president of 
diamond distributors. Um, so, oh, Jeppy hmm. himself. Jeppy himself. Yeah. And he, oh, he's he's actually a pretty. Seems like a pretty cool guy. I don't know. Um, he, he came off pretty likable, no, despite he, being the the monopoly, you know, overlord of the comics industry. Uh, here's the thing with Jeppy. And I think I will say this and leave it at that. Jeppy is likable. His likability is so well known that this is the the single biggest reason why no one has ever wanted to compete with him. He's <laughs> the the way that he conducts business. It's like a benevolent dictator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd say that's fair. Yeah, <laughs> it's a fair yeah. assessment. And uh, the, the ironic thing is the two competitors that have sprung up to kind of assist DC at this point in time, they're supplied by Diamond. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're Diamond customers, you know. Uh, it's uh, yeah. Midtown Comics and one other one I can't remember off the top of my head. But, you know, Midtown Comics is obviously a huge retailer of comic books in New York City. <laughs> and, you know, they're just doing these mail-in publishing distribution methods, you know, and I, I don't know. I kind of wonder if their copies are going to be collectible, if they're different in any way, shape, or form. Because That's a really good question. Because if they are different, I might want to grab some because they might be those rare collectibles that, you know, nobody can get a hold of in the future. Yeah. So that, that's something to think about. But uh, first, you got to find a retailer that actually bought some. Uh, a, a retailer that bought some and is willing to, as many retailers are seeing this now, cross Jeppy in order to get sales going. Yeah, which, yeah, it's a challenge, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> All things considered. Again, he seems like a very likable guy with good intentions, but... Uh, he, he's likable. I, I mean, straight up. It's yeah. Like, I've listened to the podcast with him and not only is he the person that I would want to get a beer with, he's the person that I would go to whenever I'm having a problem with anything. Yeah. So that is how likable this benevolent dictator is. No doubt about it. But it's it's a really good listen. If you got the time, go listen to Kevin Smith's Fat Man on Batman latest episode with uh, Mark Bernard in there. Because it, it really is enlightening, kind of <laughs> seeing his perspective on things and how they're developing. I, I kind of wish they would have gotten more into the nitty-gritty of the logistics of it, but uh, I get it. You're trying to play nice and <laughs> not grill him too hard. Um, right. And you know Kevin Smith. He doesn't want to anger anybody to their face. Oh, Unless not, it's Bruce Willis. It's not pro- even a fucking little <laughs> bit. <laughs> oh, He'll anger Bruce Willis to his face because, you know... Once you find out your uh one of your heroes and icons is basically a fucking paycheck player. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of paycheck players, did you see that Harrison Ford almost wrecked his plane again? <laughs> and I'm pretty sure committed a felony by cl- crossing an airstrip <laughs> that while a plane was landing. Uh committing a felony that no one's going to call him on <laughs> the because dude has crashed his plane twice <laughs> and he still has a a pilot's license what is going on <laughs> like, i get it he's wealthy and we all love him but he probably shouldn't be flying uh i don't think he's all there i just i, I think he, he's a little the man's in his 70s i think there's a little something missing <laughs> whatever he's got going on up there i'm pretty sure it's still better than what's going on with joe biden oh no <laughs> yep Yep, I'm saying it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm saying the it. apocalypse couldn't have come any sooner. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't have come at a worse, I, I mean, better time. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of the apocalypse, let's go back to uh, the subject at hand, which is Tales uh, from the Crypt. Remember, you can listen to us on Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, uh, SoundCloud. Oh, no, not SoundCloud. Fuck you, SoundCloud. <laughs> Your infrastructure sucks. Yeah. It, uh, reach out to us if you fix it. <laughs> and Podbean, YouTube, of course, if you want to watch us and see our ugly mugs and the graphics we put on the green screen it, to uh, accessorize the show. SoundCloud, if you want us, fix your RSS feed. <laughs> or, you know, have one. Have one. 
Yes, that's what I meant. Uh, <laughs> we are also on Patreon, of course. If you want to reach out and support us, we'd be very, very grateful. We're at patreon.com forward slash hit the books. It helps us keep the lights on, keep the show running and developing, of course. And if you can't contribute or don't want to contribute, we're happy to have you here. Just like and subscribe. It really does help us get those numbers up so we can finally get over a certain threshold and you know maybe, maybe try to build to something a little bigger and get more episodes out there. All right, so back to the movie. Tales from the Crypt is a 1972 uh, British horror film that was directed by Freddie Francis. Now, this was produced by a company that was known almost exclusively for making anthology horror films. So basically, every single one was a collection of like short, you know, film, almost like TV episodes, but in built into a, a full feature length movie. Yeah, these were vignettes. And they all pretty much had the same concept where there was some kind of setup for a group of people to come together and then some thing would cause them to either relive things that have already happened or see the future or whatever the case is. Whatever, you know, plot tool you need to combine these separate totally separate entities into one cohesive movie and then have some kind of collective ending with yeah. all of the parties involved um so very interesting the company is called uh amicus productions uh they're relatively short-lived they were active between 1962 and 1977 and were founded surprisingly by american producers and screenwriters uh <laughs> milton sabusky and max rosenberg so British film company created by American producers and screenwriters that produced almost exclusively horror anthology films from 1962 to 1977. Doesn't get more fringe than that, really. <laughs> I, that that, uh, that sounds like the story of uh, filmmakers just trying to get their film made by any means necessary. Yeah, uh, you know, maybe it was cheaper to uh, film in the UK, or maybe they just had you know, better talent access because of the kind of Shakespeare traditions uh, Possibly. in the UK. Um, it's it's just, you know, an interesting background to think about that they were able to produce this film at all. It's kind of an interesting story, uh, even though all of the uh, movies more or less are horror-themed or sci-fi-themed. They didn't have the rights to any specific product until... Um, one of the producers really fell in love with an old comic series called Tales from the Crypt and um, The Vault of Horror and um, a handful of other EC titles. Uh, similarly named EC Comics was kind of known for being the kind of edgy, more adult-themed books. They were generally horror books, although not exclusively. There was plenty of satire and... They really kind of pushed the envelope in the 50s, which led to their demise, unfortunately, because of uh, American politics and uh, a very strong conservative movement that uh, basically babied every comic book product down to what we laugh about and the campy over the top. <laughs> this is uh, what happens when executives come to the conclusion that something is meant for children. We can't have Spider-Man just shooting white fluid out of himself <laughs> on a comic book. No, Spider-Man saved the industry. <laughs> <laughs> Spider-Man came later. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, literally. <laughs> 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 um, uh, love isn't always on time. But again, I'm not I, I'm not going to jump too far into the weeds because if we do, we'll never get through the actual review. <laughs> but uh, just interesting history. Go look it up if you have the time. EC Comics, standing for uh, Entertaining Comics. And they were basically collections of short tales. They didn't have a lot of books that were kind of uh, syndicated or kept regular you know, with canon or anything like your typical superhero books. Um, but they were pretty popular. And unfortunately, in the 1950s, 
uh, with the whole McCarthyism and the, the fear mongering about communism and how anything that wasn't patriotic and didn't depict the stereotypical, you know, high tier point of a, a white suburban family where the man exclusively works and the woman is a good housekeeper and there's a boy and a girl and maybe a dog or whatever, <laughs> white picket fence. If you weren't depicting that, you were harming the welfare of the children with your, <laughs> your comic books. I want Norman Rockwell or get out. <laughs> yeah, that's essentially what happened. And so there were several efforts to create different comic codes. Some were more successful than others. And essentially, it was all driven by various politicians who influenced uh, the actual distributors. Diamond. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. One reason why Diamond <laughs> is so beloved <laughs> is that they don't do this. Um but basically, they influenced distributors to not be willing to ship and produce and retailers to not put things on the shelves if they violated any of these uh, standards that they were creating, some of which weren't really written in stone, but were obviously there. For example, uh, there's a really famous uh, story about the owner of EC Comics basically going to war with the head judge of... Ooh. the ratings board because he was demanding that they take out a story that featured a black astronaut and for very obvious <laughs> very racist uh reasons the guy did not want that and thought that telling kids specifically young white suburban kids <laughs> <laughs> that black people could be astronauts <laughs> was apparently too far <laughs> Uh, in the 1950s, and that would corrupt the ch- the youth, I guess. And obviously, he went went <laughs> went and fought against this guy in court quite a bit, and it led to the demise of EC Comics. Unfortunately, basically, he won his case and was able to produce it and have people retail it. But then the retailers and the producers and everybody involved were influenced by this whole conundrum and just completely dropped everything they had. And then they tried to produce on a separate outlet, but it just never picked up traction because they didn't have, you know, quite the global reach that the comics code industry did. So yeah, uh, this is like saying, "Oh, those black people." uh, I mean, we just gave them rights. Do we really want to go out and say (laughs) to all of these normal white children that even they could be astronauts? Yeah, and remember, this is before Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and you know, both led their movements and kind of pushed the envelope. You know, before J.F. Kennedy got to step in and sign some laws. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, and even then, obviously, it didn't fix everything. so, Steps in the right direction. <laughs> this is before even all of that. So you got to imagine the yeah. type of environment where we have this communist focus, you know, where you don't care about anything else and it's got to be the the American way or uh, nothing Im- else, you know. Imagine the balls you got to have to feature something like that knowing full well that it's probably going to get shot down and then like when you do get shot down say no i am going to fight you on yeah. this one like this not only is this like the right way to be political with comics this was doing it like this was in the 50s that 50s, this happened? Yep. Mid, early like, to mid-50s. Imagine preceding the civil rights movement in comic books. Yeah. So like that, that is a thing that happened. Comic <clears throat> books was forward thinking all the way back then. Yeah, and I mean, if you go back to the original even Batman and Superman comics, they were much more grounded. <laughs> they weren't the campy, over-the-top, ridiculous thing that we think of when we think about old comics today. Yeah, That stuff was brought about by the 1950s McCarthyism and the very strong conservative movement in the country, the kind of uh, response to counterculture and the fight for civil rights. All that you know, changed towards the end of the 60s and into the 70s where comics, again, took a more darker and grounded approach yeah. for obvious reasons. You had the Vietnam War going on and raging for years and years. 
You had uh, the civil rights movement, which is obviously making a big impact in the culture. You had the rock and roll culture yeah. forming. Uh, you had the seeds of kind of uh, rap culture starting to grow. Uh, just all these different things c- coming together in American culture and really global culture. Um that changed all of this but unfortunately ec comics was kind of a casualty of that early really strong really overwhelmingly uh, gross yeah <laughs> part of our history unfortunately um it's unfortunate and ironically the only thing that they lived off of after that was mad magazine <laughs> so that was the only line that they could publish they i mean they even went as far as to say that anything that had the words terror or horror or suspense were too violent and were going to frighten children and corrupt children and cause them to be less than perfect so obviously that attacked like 90 percent of their line because they were producing largely horror themed stories and scary stories and then they tried to change to a more sci-fi themed output but obviously it wasn't taking off because that wasn't what they were known for um that so. that brings me to the uh realization that like one of the very first things that the character of all characters that uh would have been offending this ant-man literally came up in a comic called Tales of Suspense. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's very ridiculous, very from a modern perspective you're like what the hell were they thinking? Why was anybody agreeing to this, you know? <laughs> it's like who went along with this? But you know, it's just thing, you know, in the 80s they had the whole, you know, escapade against uh, metal music and basically they wanted ratings on all of the albums or whatever because the Judas priest was causing kids to worship Satan and <laughs> and they were corrupting our youth to murder people. Oh, and, that's uh, what Judas priest was doing. Yeah, apparently. He wasn't just doing dudes. I mean, the, when you <laughs> we have D Snyder from Twisted Sister having to go into court on the behalf of the industry because you're so stupid. <laughs> I, just, I just, you know. He made a music video that was literally inspired by Looney Tunes. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's the most ridiculous thing. And it, it it happens in cycles in our country, unfortunately. It, it, yeah. It comes in again, and then it gets rebelled against, and then it goes away, and things are kind of okay again, and then it just... It, previously on Think of the Children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what they were saying. Yep, think, think of, of the, the children. children. <laughs> just ridiculous um but uh again if you are interested at all and have the time it is worth looking into (laughs) and i'm i'm sure at some point we'll do an episode about the history of the comics code authority and all this other stuff sure we could do at least a couple on that but uh back to the movie at hand uh so it at this point in history the 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 comic book was beloved for a lot of people that were invested in it, but it had been dead for a long time. So the producer was able to get the rights to Tales from the Crypt and uh, The Vault of Horror, which were both EC properties, but that had just not been used in a long time and obviously didn't have a lot of value anymore. And so they got the rights and they basically followed the same protocol that they did for all their other movies <laughs> same layout <laughs> anthology uh, you know organization four or five six people at a time coming in and each having an individual story that culminate in one big collective story and that's exactly what happens in this movie um it was reviewed actually fairly well it got a fairly good reception uh, which is always good to hear from any kind of comic book movie. So hopefully, <laughs> it was definitely good for us to hear going into this. <laughs> yeah, uh, very encouraging. Again, kind of small budget. Uh, they spent uh, roughly about 120 euros, 120 thousand euros, I should say, um, on the movie, and they made their money back and then a little bit of profits. So not a, not a huge blockbuster film. You can imagine it was probably a limited release. Uh, as far as its distribution, uh, being a British film built by, you know, a fairly small film company. Um, but 
it's you know it it lived up to the uh, the hype for a lot of people and you know and while us watching it from a modern perspective you got to kind of set your expectations because there's some effects in there that are like whoa that did not age well at all nope <laughs> and, nope um, uh, definitely very early cinema that's being portrayed here yeah i almost feel like it would have looked better in black and white just because it would have hidden some of the color things like the blood yeah there's some moments of blood where it just looks like the, the cherry sauce from <laughs> like candy it, cherries it, it looks like paint no yeah. Like that, that is one of the biggest issues with this thing. And mind you, that is a a minor thing. It's like the biggest issue being like issues with color. The fact that it it definitely should have been in black and white because portraying blood on screen wasn't as advanced. Yeah. Now, uh, a lot of people, when they think of Tales from the Crypt, they probably think of the very over-the-top 90s show. I know I do. (laughs) um, Where you have the cackling, over-the-top, zombified Crypt Keeper. The, oh, you, you mean the Jim Henson's uh, very own uh, Little Dead Man? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The Tales from the Crypt. Uh, God, uh, I still remember that from HBO in the 90s. Yeah, oh it was basically, God. you know, Goosebumps for ab- adults. <laughs> y- yes, yeah. which was even on its own, it was just more different. It was horror themed Twilight Zone. Basically. Yeah. And that's essentially what this movie is. Yeah. Kind of like how we were talking on Superman and the Mole Men. It felt like just an episode of Twilight Zone, but that happens to have Superman in it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that's exactly what this movie feels like. It feels like horror themed Twilight Zone in y- color. Yes. That is exactly what it felt like. Um, but uh, I wouldn't say that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, you have basically uh, in the plot. Uh, five strangers coming together, uh, played by um, Joan Collins, Ian Hendry, Robin Phillips, Richard Green, Nigel Patrick, and the Crypt Keeper was played by Sir Rolf Richardson. So we got a sir, a knighted sir, in there as the Crypt Keeper. And he certainly has that uh, very over-the-top Shakespearean vibe about him when he he says his lines this man sounded like he belonged in a museum <laughs> <laughs> straight up yeah I, it was it was cool i i i'm gonna be honest i i kind of enjoyed it all in a campy sort of way more uh, so than batman 66 i will say that i actually appreciated the format uh, of these stories, uh, specifically them, like the the way that this entire like collection of stories is told is that getting into the beginning of this, every single person that you meet uh, that comes into this crypt, they're all uh, seemingly on a tour, and then they get led underneath uh, into the catacombs, and they're told the the history of the monks there that were, you know, practicing their faith openly before Henry VIII had uh, needlessly persecuted every single last one of them. They then get led into what is possibly the most ominous-looking room in a catacomb I've ever seen, only to be met by an aforementioned monk. Yep. That monk being Sir Ralph Richardson. (laughs) And there he was in the most obvious situation (laughs) that you do not want to be in. It's Uh, like you're you're in a stone room, which (laughs) that by itself should be like an indicator that I don't know what you did in your life before, but if you find yourself in a completely stone room, somehow you fucked up. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Honestly, I... I think the only reason this film works is because they're all British and polite. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Almost you, entirely. You know, a fucking American would be like, yeah, this doesn't look right. I'm just going to go back the way we came. Thanks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> once they walk into the room with the big giant skull and the single guy sitting on a throne, <laughs> it seems kind of obvious that maybe something's not right here. <laughs> this is like, wait, there's... 
there's a skull behind um uh the, the, where's the exit it was where's like the exit? it's like the <laughs> temple of doom <laughs> from uh, indiana jones you know like just, who just walks into one of those <laughs> But basically, they all raise a, a, a oh, you know, very posh fluff about everything, and raising a good old harumph about it. And basically, the monks reply to them is all in good time, all in good time. Have a seat, <laughs> all in good time. I assure you, I have a purpose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so again, there's foreshadowing all throughout this. Again, go watch this movie because there's minor spoilers but three two one you've been warned yep in the introduction where they're going through the catacombs and being led through on this tour um the gentleman behind the first character that talks about her story uh he picks up a pen off the ground and hands it to her and it's this big flower brooch it's very obvious well that becomes a key feature in the first story that kind of foreshadows what's going on here so The monk kind of calms them, and the monk is eventually revealed to be the Crypt Keeper, more or less, from the comic books, which is, you know, the original Crypt Keeper was a little bit more animated, but still the aesthetic of the original comic book Crypt Keeper, not so much the (laughs) Henson version. (laughs) Is A Crypt Keeper that looks like he could actually keep a crypt? Yeah. As opposed to just being a skull puppet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> but basically, he's very vague about things, and all of the people are kind of on edge and kind of yelling at him, and some of them sit down and comply. Other ones are st- just remain standing and, you know, belligerent, basically. And he asks about the first woman's plans, and then he kind of repeats himself after every individual conversation, a word. In this case, it was about plans. So it jumps into a story. Uh, And something to mention real quick, not all of these stories are from the comics. Some of them were taken straight out of the comics, two of them specifically, and then one was taken, or two were taken out of a written book series from about the Tales from the Crypt. Hmm. And then one was actually taken from another EC Comics series. Uh, Let me pull it up real quick. The Haunt of Fear. So oh. <laughs> the first story was from The Vault of Horror. So again, not Tales from the Crypt, The Vault of Horror number 35. Yeah. The second one was from Tales of the Crypt number 23. Uh the third one was from Haunt of Fear. The fourth one was from The Haunt of Fear, which is the the book series, and then uh Blind Alleys was from The Tales from the Crypt. So only two were actually from the t- titular comic book, ironically. And then the follow-up movie, which we'll be reviewing next, is called The Vault of Horror, which features five stories from Tales from the Crypt and not The Vault of Horror. (laughs) So it's all very confusing how they got the rights and then proceeded to not use them. Uh, Kind of a bit of a switcheroo. Yeah, it's strange. (laughs) But again, everything about this seems like a strange uh, organization. So... um, Essentially, we jump into the first story. It's Christmas, and you see the introduction of this middle to older age gentleman who is putting presents under the tree for his beloved wife, and he reads off his card for the best wife, blah, 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 whatever the case was. I can't remember the specific wording he used, but something along those lines. Then sits down to read the paper. Then the next thing you know, you hear a thud, and you see blood splatter on the newspaper. Cool effect. And fun note, I don't know if you noticed, but I noticed a Richard Pryor cameo on the back of the newspaper. No. When he first opens it up, there's a big print of Richard Pryor right there. (laughs) I was like, yeah. (laughs) Of course, Richard Pryor famously was also in a comic book movie, Superman 3. Ooh. (laughs) <laughs> it wasn't good, but <laughs> we'll get to that on a future episode. Oh, we will. My God, that movie. I'll say this. It wasn't Superman for the quest for peace. <laughs> it's true. I like how Richard Pry- Pryor basically does the same exact role that Jamie Foxx did in Spider-Man. 
<laughs> which is computer nerd <laughs> and a totally inappropriate you know character play i don't know it yeah but doesn't work n neither of those characters make sense on their face no <laughs> <laughs> um but we jump into the story essentially the the woman kills her husband and is basically trying to murder him for the insurance money on christmas eve I have some issues with this one more than the other ones, I think, just because I think it held tension probably the best out of all of them, except maybe the last one. Yeah. But the story itself, I don't understand her plan. She was going to murder her husband and then make it look like he fell down the steps. Is that, that essentially what she was trying to do uh, until it got interrupted? I think this was entirely... A situation of improvisation as uh I don't know if it's just me, but it seemed as though when she took her dead freshly dead husband's body over to the steps that she kind of like accidentally slipped and he just kind of f fell and she hmm. just kind of went with it I that think... that was my interpretation of that scene, whether or not it was intentional. God, if it was intentional, then her plan makes absolutely no sense at all. <laughs> well, that's that was my issue. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> none of this really made a whole lot of sense. She, she's doing it while her daughter's in the house. While her daughter is in the house. And upstairs, <laughs> you know, going, Mommy, is Santa here yet? Blah, L blah, blah. Literally, that child could have come downstairs at any moment. Yeah, at the same moment. She's murdering her dad <laughs> and dragging him across the living room floor. Uh, so, interesting concept. I th yeah. I get what they were going for. I think they were less thinking about the logic of the situation and more just trying to have the imagery of the daughter being there and showing just how cruel and vindictive this woman was being. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to say what the situation... It's not... You would think it's maybe it's like a gold digger or something, but she has a, a daughter who's like, five six seven years old like not not a baby you yeah know? so clearly it's not like they haven't been together for a long time and she's murdering him for the insurance money now right this episode also brought up something that i really hate about 70s culture and that is the fucking furniture it is <laughs> <laughs> the aesthetics of the room are fucking horrible you got those bright green furry rugs and just uh, it's the worst and she has like a phallic phone later on she has, she thinks about calling the cops she she has this phallic device that she has to dial She's through <laughs> through the sphincter <laughs> Like dialing in someone's ball sack. Yeah, I'll put a picture on the YouTube channel if I can find one on the internet. But no, we're trying uh, to actually put this on YouTube. <laughs> trying not to get flagged. It's a phone. <laughs> but it was it was uh, rough, rough aesthetics. But uh, she totally has that kind of Bond girl vibe. That you know, the spy who shagged she me type of vibe. She definitely looked like someone who should have been a Bond girl. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Oh yeah. Um. <laughs> But basically, she murders her husband. She's trying to think about how she can, you know, make it look like an accident. And th this is where I think I disagree with your on with your interpretation mm -hmm. because the crypt keeper keeps saying plans to mm. her, which makes me think she was planning this, you right. know. And then the plans went awry when the crazy, you know, psycho <laughs> from the local psych ward right. started trying to break in. Uh, so basically, long story short. She's trying to pacify her, her daughter and make her go to bed and stop asking about Santa and all the stuff so she can successfully make it look like, her, like the father tripped down the stairs and, right. and died instead of her bludgeoning him over the head with a basically a fireplace spike. We're not given any reason solidly outside of the safe that she ends up opening like almost immediately after killing this guy. Um, as to why, in fact, that she wanted this guy dead in the first place. 
it seemed as though like she was getting the the title to a deed or an inheritance or like a business or something. Yeah, and then she was so brazen that she actually took it with her up to her daughter's bedroom and, yeah. <laughs> and put it on her lap while she was tucking her into bed and stuff. Right, and then the kid asks, like, oh, what's this? Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. No, no, don't worry about it. And give it. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I think by far, uh, I, I would assume you probably agree with me. I think this one, this character is probably the worst of all of the characters. <clears throat> probably the poorest conceived. Yeah, I think the some of the other characters are like, uh, uh, I don't know if you deserve the end. <laughs> Uh, but okay, I get it for the sake of the the movie, right? But this one is like, yeah, you you deserve oh, what oh, you yeah. got, one hundred percent. Literally, no one in this entire movie <laughs> deserves the end of this movie more than this lady. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> So basically, uh, the radio start turns on, and this is what gave me very strong Twilight vibes. <laughs> was the radio yeah. announcing? Oh, you know, yeah, <laughs> that a psych. A psych ward had lost one of its uh, patients from the criminally insane psych ward, and he's expected to be very uh, dangerous and make sure you lock all your doors and windows and this and that. Oh, and also he's dressed like Santa Claus, so maybe be on the lookout. Yeah. So (laughs) (laughs) she drops the dead husband to go lock the doors and close the (laughs) the shutters and stuff, and then goes back, and then she notices Santa Claus outside. Like, oh no. Yeah. (laughs) Guess who showed up on the worst of nights? (laughs) Of all the times that this guy could have been released. Homicidal? Santa Claus. So uh, she starts closing the shutters and she's hiding and she picks up the phone to call the cops and then she looks at the dead body and she's like, oh no. you know. Now this is where, again, I have a huge problem with this particular story. Yeah. I would just call the fucking cops and say that the crazy Santa Claus murdered him. You know... <laughs> <laughs> so, like, that's the perfect out. The perfect alibi. Your uh, your daughter will not blame you. <laughs> okay, he, here's the thing that also makes me think that the whole falling down the stairs was an accident. Uh, in terms of uh, viewing this as a plan, it looks like not only like if this were a plan that it was completely ill-conceived, but a lot of it looks like it's improvised on the spot yeah and she keeps going back and forth between addressing the crazy santa claus outside and addressing the dead body that she's trying to make look like an accident and she only gets halfway into calling like 911 or the however they call the police in britain and just proceeds to like oh no wait i'll just close this whole thing off by myself yeah (laughs) handle this dead body by myself and, like she Try even to, takes like, the time to wash everything it's and like wash it out of the carpet because that's what we care about yeah. right now. Uh, she like try to the like, Richard Pryor newspaper in the fire. How <laughs> dare she? <laughs> <laughs> How dare you put that man on fire? <laughs> <laughs> he does that to himself. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, she then like scoops up like whatever a little bit of blood paint. <laughs> yeah, it's, the blood's pretty rough, and especially in this episode, it tries to pour it in what sound or looks believable. I was yeah. like, let me just glob some on his head. Yeah. You know, and, From a little wine glass. And, and just on the ground here. And then uh, let me just make sure all of my, my windows and doors are locked. And where's yeah. my child? Meanwhile, <laughs> she knows that predatory <laughs> Santa is circling the house. Yeah, yes. And she thinks because she locked a shutter that she's, <laughs> she's, fun, she's perfectly safe. <laughs> so... Yeah, oh, but, he's crazy, but he won't break the <laughs> windows, right? <laughs> Surely there's not a back door. <laughs> I don't know. It's just... Also, where is my child? A lot of goofy <laughs> things. And you, uh, this is where the story has its you know crazy twist at the end. Yeah. The child, of course, looking for Santa Claus and refusing to go to bed because she wants to see Santa Claus. See Santa Claus! And decides to let Sandy in. <laughs> And the mother, <laughs> the mother comes out from successfully framing the body as you know dying on the steps, and the daughter pops her head out from behind the curtain. She goes, "My 
oh, guess what I did? <laughs> <laughs> and she looks up at the door, and her daughter's bedroom door is open. <laughs> She's like, Santa Claus is here! And then the, the murderous Santa Claus bursts through the curtain and chases her over by the fireplace and starts choking her to death. And then, w- 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 roughly. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, mind you, before she had suffered from the most deadly shoulder rub of her life. <laughs> um, when the child announced she found Santa, my first response was, oh no. <laughs> I mean, the, I will say this. The ending to that story is the fucking best. <laughs> Your fucking shithead kid <laughs> ruined everything. <laughs> Not only does the shithead kid ruin everything, but the kid gets to meet Santa Claus. <laughs> and, and watch him murder her mother. <laughs> and by that, I mean proceed to give the child the gift that she really deserves. I mean, to a, be fair. A mother who's not a nut. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess she gets all that insurance money now, so. Yep. <laughs> Santa brought you a present, I suppose. And then she can grow up to be Batman. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean that that's that's how Batman happens, right? Uh she sure sur- survives uh Right a, Bob <laughs> survives a uh an insane asylum patient coming and killing both of her parents <laughs> only to receive what I'm assuming is at least some kind of fortune. Yeah. Was, <laughs> so I I really enjoyed the ending of this story probably more than any of the others which kind of redeems the whole story <laughs> because of how illogical some of the things were. The ending is just so good for that one. But it kept you engrossed, so, yeah. th- which is important. So It's like, oh my God, what's she going to do? Yeah. <laughs> so I enjoyed the first one. Then it flashes back and she's kind of like realizing that, did this happen? Is this, he- this a nightmare? What is he describing I'm, what I'm going to do? But remember, she's wearing the brooch that was in the gift. <laughs> yeah. Um. So clearly this is after the fact. Mm-hmm. Foreshadowing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then we jump into the second story. Now, the second story, it's a little bit more docile, a little bit more subtle, and probably, I'd I'd say it had the smallest impact of the entire group. Would you agree? Um... I'm going to say this one actually made me laugh my ass off just thinking about it. <laughs> it was, the, the, the premise of the story, it starts off with, uh, well, uh, a guy planning to go on a late night business trip. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which, uh, that's code for he's going to see another woman. <laughs> In, in case you didn't know that already. Um, he then goes to, you know, meet this, I'm assuming, much younger woman. Uh, uh, didn't really get to see the, uh, like, the actual, like, mother of his kids for all that much. You know, watching this episode, it really reminded me of the wife and the eventual new wife mm-hmm. of Don Draper from Mad Men. Oh, they look exactly alike. Oh my god! Both of the women, <laughs> both the wife and um, the the, I guess mistress. Yeah, both look exactly like the new young girl from Mad Men and the original wife from oh Mad Men. Oh my god! You're you, uh, which you... makes me wonder <laughs> <laughs> if the writer of that show or the director or the casting director, whoever was involved in that decision was influenced by this at all. Maybe. <laughs> because Maybe. it was very reminiscent. Yeah. They, they look... Just thinking back on it, they do look really similar thematically. They God. really do. Even their hairstyles and the color of their hair yeah. and their age. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very... They have two kids. Yeah. Oh, a my God. A boy and a girl. Yeah. Oh. It's very, very familiar. It, it felt like Don Draper. Yeah. It, yeah. And then we get to the M. Night Shyamalan part of this where, okay, yeah, he, he has come to the conclusion where he's actually going to uh, up and leave his wife for this younger woman. 
because and abandoning his kids. You know, it's kind of it's kind of sad when yeah, you I, think I mean, about it because he's it's he's sad saying bye to his up. wife and he's like, like trying to s- avoid saying bye to his kids because obviously he cares about them a lot and yeah he kind of reflects back on it later in the episode. You know, obviously he has a very painful goodbye that they, the kids don't obviously know is a <laughs> a permanent goodbye. Yeah, and then when he, he leaves, he's talking to the new mistress and. He's talking about all, of, you know, what he had to sacrifice and all this stuff, you know. So it's it's clear that he cares and he knows what he's doing is wrong, yeah. which makes him probably, I don't know, probably the least offensive of the group as far as what they did wrong. That's saying a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the the other well, maybe pe- maybe. Mm. Yeah. He's he's bottom two for sure. <laughs> at, at the very least, bottom two. Because my God, the others. Yeah, there's some, some are really bad. Ooh. <laughs> the first one being the the worst by we, far. Oh yeah, started off with the worst, and then we got like probably the least to second least offensive one of these yeah. people. Um, what happens? Uh, like during the whole like oh I, like i found the the woman i actually love and i'm going to run away with her and i'm sorry kids but uh, mm, uh i'll find you eventually or you'll find me who knows um proceeds to you know they they switch you know because they're driving a long way they they switch seats and he falls asleep and has a really really bad dream that he violently wakes up from, and at almost immediately after violently waking up from it, uh, realizes that, oh, they're about to hit something. Or as I said, oh my God, I forgot that I'm letting a woman drive. Ugh. 1970s. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh no, this is like, I, I'm not going to trust you to steer clear of the thing that's about to hit us head on. <laughs> You're not doing it, so I've got to. Yeah, <laughs> control freak for sure. Yeah, th- this guy proceeds to get both him and his mistress into a car wreck. And then, well, the point of view changes for a little bit. Yeah, we changed to a first-person point of view. Yeah, that was that was a bit of a bit of a shift. Yeah, which is kind of... I don't know. That was probably pretty original, especially for the time. Yeah, I, that I can't think of anything prior to that that I'm aware of. I'm not the biggest, you know, old movie buff, but I can't think of a single example where yeah. they have a first person perspective like that. Yeah, neither can I. Uh, like not not in the seventies. So that was actually super creative and super cool. Mm-hmm. And again, you know, they got a lot of praise critically for this film. So you can see like little sparks of like imagination that are like, oh, that's pretty neat. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, this leads into well, the uh, Sha- uh M Night Shyamalan twist. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to say love Shyamalan. Sh- Shyamalan, man. <laughs> you love yourself Shyamalan some Shyamalan. Shyamalan ding dong. <laughs> <laughs> love his movies. Yeah, yeah, his his movies are wonderful. Um, <laughs> the the twist comes in which, from a first person perspective, we find what we're assuming is the guy who was running off to be with some other woman. Uh, he's trying to get back home, trying to figure like get back to his life. Oh my God, uh, like I just about died. I realized the error of my ways and I'm going to go back to my wife and kids and what the hell is this other guy doing in my house? Yeah. What the hell is my mistress saying that I'm dead? Oh, uh, um, what what happened? Well, I need to look into it. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so basically he, the big build up is he, he stops and tries to get people to hitchhike him back into town but they stop and they're like what are you doing get out of the road and then they look at him and scream and drive off and run away and all this stuff then he goes to his original home where his original wife is and looks at the little placard next to the doorbell i guess people used to put their names next to their doorbell i don't don't know like it was a fucking office or some shit Uh, it's probably a bad idea today (laughs) (laughs) i don't want people to know that I live here by name. Yeah. And he noticed that the last name is completely different. Yeah. And so he knocks on the door 
His wife opens the door and then screams horrifically and slams the door shut and then runs inside and he looks in the window and there's some other guy consoling her and she's hysterical and won't talk about what what happened. So clearly you're getting the idea that he doesn't look like he's supposed to look. Yeah. Um, and so he goes to his mistress's house and before she had all the furniture gone because she had shipped it to move wherever they were running away to. But uh, <clears throat> he knocks on the door and she opens it, and she doesn't freak out or anything like the other, the original wife did. And then he says who he is, and she goes, that's impossible, blah, blah, blah. And she, he comes in the side, sees all the furniture is back somehow. And <clears throat> she talks about the crash and how she was blinded by the, the crash. And then and she talks about how it was two years ago. And he goes, two years ago, that okay, kid, it's impossible. And then he looks in a mirror and he sees this, probably the the worst effect of the entire <laughs> film, which is just his face with like some gray, some gray greenish going on. Gray paint, I guess, on there, kind of making him look ghoulish, I guess. I <laughs> and that isn't the twist. The twist is that was his dream. Yep. <laughs> and so he wakes up, screams, and then ah! thing crashes. And then, honestly, I think the director just liked that they got that sequence down and it just was, had to put it in there twice. It was so nice. It was worth doing twice, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and then flash forward, we're back in the crypt uh, with the other individuals, and that's the end of that story. Oh, yeah. I'm back in the crypt again. <laughs> I'm back <laughs> in the <laughs> crypt again. <laughs> so we're back in the crypt again. And oh, yeah. <laughs> this is where the third individual is probably the youngest. Maybe the woman's younger. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Yeah. But he's probably the youngest in the room. And he, he's got this nice black suit on with a, with a flower on the lapel. Again, kind of foreshadowing it, yeah. from the story. Yeah. Kind of wearing his sin on his sleeve. Yeah. And they go back and forth and, you know, asking why he's there. He doesn't understand. And then they flash into the story. Now, this one, this one I probably, in, I don't know. This one actually hurt me. This Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> this one probably had the most impact on me personally. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is the one I'm going to think about when I'm trying to go to sleep at night because... It's basically a story of how this guy terrorizes this poor old man. This poor old man who did nothing to deserve this terrorizing. Literally, literally nothing. Except for literally living in a neighborhood where this guy lives. It's only because of living close to this person that all of these bad things happen to this poor old man. Yeah, so oh. the story focuses... It starts with this very friendly old man. Now... Mm. I kind of have a problem with this old man. Uh, okay, there, there's a very, there's a very modern problem with this old man. Yeah, well, like, it, it was, it existed back then. We I, just didn't talk about it, right? <laughs> so. Like modern sensibilities would have precluded this situation from ever happening. Like even like twenty to thirty years ago, but in the seventies. Yeah. Specifically in the seventies in Britain, yeah, it's it's rough. <laughs> y yeah, I, it, you have to suspend your disbelief a little bit for the story <laughs> to make sense and for you to sympathize with the old man, of course, a little bit. A but little bit. Uh, it's a little weird that the old man just has these children coming into his house every single day, and he's giving them candy and toys every single day. Uh, he is he is revealed to, and I don't know if this makes this better or worse. Um, <laughs> he is revealed to have been a toy maker, in, yeah. like in his uh, younger years. Yeah. So, it, you know, this president for it to be happening, but and he's obviously portrayed as a very sweet, kind old man. But it's hard to <laughs> wonder if, from a societal know, perspective. He's not it's, a pedophile. It, it, it's very difficult to see literally the entire neighborhood not paying attention to their children at all, <laughs> and just letting them into this old single man's house. Yeah, by himself. Yeah. 
it's a little what it's a little suspect <laughs> what it's a little suspect uh, uh, okay i'm going to make the same argument that i made for the situation having to do with michael jackson while nothing's been proven to have happened if something did that man is not the only guilty party. Those parents <laughs> are entirely <laughs> complicit in anything having happened yeah. by way of negligence. C- terrible negligence, to be T- honest. Terrible, blatant, neighborhood welcomed negligence. These kids are just running around with like no one watching them. No one. Yeah. So basically, <laughs> uh, this is a very kind old man. He's very friendly with all the kids. He has a bunch of adopted dogs that he houses and lives with. His wife is deceased, and he has dinner with his deceased wife on you know, her picture every day. And has a very simple, hearty life where he's just not bothering anybody really. And unfortunately, he's got the main character as his neighbor who yeah. is angry at the old man because he's too poor to keep his house up kept to maintain property values and make everything look nice and pretty like all the other homes in yeah. this suburban community uh very uppity very you know high and mighty talking about how rich he is and how this good guy fan- finances are this guy belongs on some fucking downton abbey bullshit yeah and he's i i'm guessing it's his father that he's staying with and talking to the entire time that is an assumption that's made i don't think that uh i don't think the old man's name is mentioned much and if his name is i'm pretty sure i don't remember him mentioning his relation yeah. to our main character for the story. Whoever he is, you would think he would speak up at some point and be like, yeah, maybe you shouldn't do that. Maybe that's that. No, leave the fucking old guy alone. Right. <laughs> you know, but the I, old I, man's just like, nah, I'll read my newspaper. <laughs> I'll, I'll read my newspaper and not look out for a fellow old man in our community. <laughs> 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 Who he even talks about being as a very nice, you know, good man, you know. It's, it's like a, I'm sure if I just talk him up, I will dissuade my uh young gentleman friend from like doing anything to him. Quite the opposite, actually. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like that guy's just as at fault as anybody else. Uh and he's com- in fact the entire town's kind of at uh, fault. Oh yeah, they're complicit. At the very least, they're complicit. Yeah. So basically, he comes up with a scheme that he's going to terrorize him in a variety of ways in order to get him to sell his home, hopefully cheaply. Yeah. Because, again, you know, it's not only about getting this guy out of the neighborhood and fixing up the house. It's about getting it cheap, and so I can keep my money. (laughs) So... Doing things on the up and up, as it were. Yeah, he starts by going into the neighbor's yard at night and destroying all of the b- beautiful roses that he's grown over years. Uh, and the, the neighbor next door to the sweet old man. Next door to the old man, yep. Yeah. And frames his dogs for the crime, even though the dogs are clearly fenced the entire time, which, yeah, leap in logic there, but okay, whatever. Yeah, that first he takes his dogs. So basically, they get a court order, the neighborhood, which is obviously complicit Mm -hmm. (laughs) and just jumping to conclusions. Yeah. No investigation happens or anything. Yeah, the neighborhood has like a neighborhood watch, I guess, that comes and takes the dogs and says that, hey, even if, you know, there wasn't a court order to take these dogs away from you, you don't have them licensed because there's, you know, runaways that you adopted, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So the old man's very sad, very torn up, uh, devastated that they took his dogs away. Uh, The next step, he goes around the town and starts telling all the parents that these children have been going into this creep's house and that, you know, it's dirty and filthy in there and that he lives in a cesspool of his own filth and blah, blah, blah. And again, the parents are like, oh, thanks for telling us. We had no idea our children were up to that. Blah, blah, blah. Again, gross negligence across the board. Oh, yeah. If not negligence, just complicit with all the problems that this guy is creating for this old man. And so the old man now has lost his dogs and he's lost the children that always came to visit him. And then he goes after his fucking retirement. 
And then this is where you're like, fuck, dude, leave the guy alone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, how many yeah, years this, does he have left? This, Just leave him alone. Th- th- this young man wanted to see this old man completely... I, I mean, it's one thing to try to convince this man to move out, but this man completely demoralizes and like emotionally destroys this poor old man. Yeah, in every way he can. Yeah. And he basically convinces the the people that own the business that where he works that they should fire him because he's a gross dirty old man and he's not productive anymore and they're like well he's only you know two months away from retirement you know we can't do that to him and make him lose his pension and this is where like everybody's complicit again but somehow Uh, he's like oh but think of the money you'll save by not paying his pension then the guy's like oh okay (laughs) suddenly i don't care (laughs) It, but money, though, it's like <laughs> mo- not for him, but for me. Like I, I want money for me, so I'm gonna rob this defenseless, poor, sweet old man of his pension that he worked his entire life for. Yeah. So God. they basically <laughs> convince him to lay him off or fire him, whatever the 1972 UK equivalent is, and he goes home without a job, still has his high spirits somehow and he he has this seance you know to try to talk to his wife and oh this is the thing that creeped me the fuck out yeah <laughs> it's so like of all the things that we could have <laughs> had this sweet old man do as a way of coping with this whole situation we have him engaging in a seance yeah <laughs> Like, not helping your case, guy. <laughs> <laughs> so he has a seance with his wife, and basically his wife communicates with him and spells out danger. As you do when you're messing with the dark arts. Yeah. <laughs> and so... Also, you, that, you think that, that entire... the spirits could have, I don't know, been a little bit more precise? Yeah. <laughs> It's like, hey, neighbor, <laughs> Todd <laughs> is an ass. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's like, oh, like apparently when we speak to our beloved from the great beyond, they can only say back one word. Terribly inefficient, guys. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> and so he has a seance, which I feel like the, of the entire story, that one's the least necessary. <laughs> yeah. Like part of it. That, that could have been completely clipped and the story would have stayed exactly the same exactly yeah and uh basically the individual um decides on valentine's day he's going to send him as the last straw to break the camel's back and get him to move out and sell his house cheaply he's going to send him a bunch of angry valentines basically insulting him with all these different valentines cards and so, sure enough, he receives a bunch of letters in the mail, and he's all excited and delighted. Uh, one on the, Valentine's Day. Yeah, he was lucky enough that one of the dogs managed to escape, and he has one of his puppies with him. And so, things are kind of looking up again. He's kind of getting over everything, getting through. And he starts opening the letters, and each one's talking about how he smells, and how he's filthy, and how he's gross, and how nobody wants him there, and blah, blah, blah. Flash forward... Uh, you see the the asshole neighbor and talking to the old guy he lives with, and then they discuss how they haven't seen him in a few days, probably over a week, and blah blah blah. And they decide to go check on him. The door is open. They walk in and they find the guy hanging. He had hung himself after reading the Valentine's cards that uh, the the asshole neighbor had sent to him, and <laughs> it's like in a con- dealing with a concentrated bout of just one miserable event after the others like first you took his dogs then you took his standing in the neighborhood being okay for children to come over which it, it, <laughs> still probably should have done that the, i mean there, there's issues <laughs> there's issues with that even being allowed as a oh, thing hello hello <laughs> little boy you want some toys and some candy i'm just a sweet old man <laughs> Are you a pedophile? (laughs) (laughs) No, why would you think that? Who taught you that word? That's an awful word. (laughs) Coming to my cellar. (laughs) All due respect, Mr. Herbert, sir. I'm a 17-year-old girl, and I don't need you here. Oh, just a (laughs) fun fact that I forgot to mention. 
the actor who is portraying the old pedophile uh, is Peter Cushing, who is actually the guy that was in love with Tales from the Crypt and actually went out and sought the rights and got the producer's permission to get the rights for this. So this whole thing wouldn't have happened at all if it wasn't for Peter Cushing, who is the old man. The, sw- the sweet old man is the one responsible for this entire movie. Yep, and he decided <laughs> to kill himself. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he probably just wanted that role. I mean, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> he gets to be the sweet old man that communes with the uh, darkness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Alistair Crawley old man. Now, that actually, that part that could have been clipped out is in its own way in their... To justify what happens next. Yeah, so what <laughs> happens next is a supernatural event. Uh, they flash forward a year to the anniversary, so Valentine's Day again, and basically they show clips, little bits at a time, where a hand's coming out of the grave where the, the old man was buried, <clears throat> and eventually you see the full kind of zombified version of him, and he starts walking away, obviously going towards the main uh, you know, antagonist. And the gentleman that the antagonist lives with goes to bed and he sits up reading his paper again with the paper. <laughs> again, it seems like with the everybody paper. has like six newspapers next to the couch <laughs> uh, throughout it, the entire show. It was a, a time of newspapers. Uh, newspapers back then are what, well, smartphones are now. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose. I just don't know why you'd have a bunch of old ones. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, the zombie goes in there and attacks him, and he leaves, lets out this big scream, which somehow doesn't wake the old guy, but, you know. Right. The next morning, the old guy comes down, and he's completely oblivious, and he opens the curtains, and it shines light on the main antagonist having been murdered and laying there on the desk. He goes over, there's, like, a crumpled up paper, again, with, like, the candy-colored blood, <laughs> you know, which just oh, looks yeah. like paint. Uh, He opens the newspaper and inside is a big message uh, basically saying, you know, you didn't live with a heart, but here's proof that you have one. And then he opens the the heart. I don't remember the specific. Uh, It says actually uh, right here on the wiki, uh, the note that uh, the older gentleman uh, unfurls reads, Happy Valentine's Day. You were mean and cruel right from the start. Now you really have no, and then he unfurls it further, and there is a still beating heart Which wrapped in paper. It's pretty brutal. It's pretty, pretty fucking metal. Fuck that, yeah. That that was that that should be the cover of a heavy metal album. Speaking of that, <laughs> if you look at the original like artwork for all of these movies that were produced by this company, I am almost certain. That I saw these posters on an episode of Cribs. What? Featuring Rob Zombie. (laughs) I I can't be certain, but I am like 99% sure that I've seen at least some of these posters before on an episode of Cribs in Rob Zombie's house. And I would not be surprised because this seems right up his alley. Oh, damn straight it does. Oh, my God. Yeah. (laughs) So we jump forward to the young man in, in the the crypt, and you know you see the flower on his lapel, calling back to his original crime, which was the the roses desecrating the roses to take the dogs away. Yeah, that 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 was, a, and a a very that was the beginning of a very elaborate plot to make an old man move out. That led to instead an old man. Committing suicide, coming back from the grave, and then tearing this young man's heart out. Very Mortal Kombat esque. <laughs> Honestly, they should put that in a Mortal Kombat game. Uh, that, which one? <laughs> <laughs> Whichever one's next. You know it's coming. Oh my god, Mortal Kombat 12. How are they going to work the one and the two in there? <laughs> and so we jump into the next story. Uh, this one featuring a businessman. And essentially, the story starts out, he's gambled with people who invested their money with him, and he gambled with it, and it didn't pan out, and now he's in a ton of debt. Stupid amount of debt. Yeah, and honestly, I think of all the people, he's probably the least 
deserving of the fate at the end of the film. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, no, I mean he he was irresponsible, but that was it. Yeah. He, he was just irresponsible. He was irresponsible trying to make everybody a lot of money and then it just didn't work out. That I mean, was his crime. That uh, that was his only crime in this entire thing. He even does the honorable thing when they're deciding between two options, between declaring bankruptcy and making everybody screwed or doing the honorable thing and selling off all his possessions to pay back the debt and pay back the people that invested in him. And he goes the honorable route. So he absolutely does not deserve the fate <laughs> that is bestowed upon him. People who actively work on the stock exchange deserve worse than this guy. <laughs> like he actually did the right thing. Yeah. Our president declared bankruptcy four times. <laughs> 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 At no point was he offering to sell off his Trump Towers in order to you know, pay back the, the money lenders. Yeah, our president is probably in the process of trying to get states to independently declare bankruptcy as a state. <laughs> <laughs> because default's easier than paying people. Right. Uh, yeah, so the guy in no way, shape, or form deserves to be here right at all like the one guy left his wife and his kids uh, you can kind of get it i guess yeah but he didn't even finish it like he didn't R even get to the finish line right you know? so it's like he the, the man in his own dream like double triple died came back from the dead only to realize it was a dream and then yeah. end up dying in the way that he dreamed yeah so he basically <laughs> realizes he made a mistake and tries to redeem himself but it's too late he's already dead yeah uh whereas this guy doesn't even do anything really wrong and R right ends up with probably the worst fate of all of them oh i mean by Th far this is the thing about this guy's fate we're, we're gonna get to it here in a second but of all the people's fates, I think this one actually brings up a, an issue technically with the story. And we'll get to that when we get to it. Okay. Um, from, from the point of trying to sell off all of his stuff, uh, they come into contact with the monkey's paw. <laughs> yeah, so he... The, the monkey paw is just a story that's you know, yeah. well known where basically a person gets a monkey paw and then typical three wishes trope, you know, right. you have three wishes, but they all go to shit because the genie's fucking with you or the yeah. mystical whatever is fucking with you. Yeah. Like you get your wish, uh, but it's granted to you. In, Quite literally. Yeah. In the worst way possible. Yeah. So basically they have this little statue, this little jade statue, and their big collection of artwork and stuff because he has been a very successful businessman. They've traveled to the world. They talk about how they got this statue in China, I think. It's one of the things they haven't sold. Yeah, and uh, basically the story behind it, and there's inscriptions on it about how you can get three wishes uh, and only three from this the statue, and then there's some written, something written, but you can't read it anymore. It's not legible. Right. Not that I think it's really relevant, because they never talk about it again. They really don't. <laughs> so I think they were setting up for something that they ended up not using, and were just like, ah, keep the footage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the the woman, the wife, I should say, to clarify, says, I want wish for lots and lots of money. Now, this is another problem I have with the story. A, the guy doesn't deserve his fate at all. Uh, neither at the end nor at the end of this particular story. <laughs> yeah. And the person doing all the wishes isn't him. It's the wife. Yeah. Who wasn't involved in any of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, he's about as innocent as you can be. <laughs> you know, his the, the thing he fucked up was that he fucked up. Like, uh, it, he, yeah. he took a gamble and it fucked up. Yeah. yeah like th this was a... Uh a very human error that he's having to supernaturally suffer for, M which, my God, the first wish, lots of money. How does she get it? <laughs> By inheriting on the double indemnity life insurance policy of her husband. So basically, we have this very strange 
scene where the guy is driving and there's some guy in a motorcycle with like a skull mask on. Oh, you mean Ghost Rider? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but I, the guy freaks out and it, they insinuate that he's in a car crash and that he dies from the car crash. Yeah. And then they get around in a long sort of way to explaining that because he had this big insurance policy and he was such a big you know, personality and had so much capital before. Yeah. That the plan was pretty large, and he had been paying it, and so now the wife has lots and lots of money as she wished. Right. And so, of course, you know she's realizing what probably happened, and she's freaking out. And the the associate that was advising him, the financial advisor, uh, from the beginning of the, I guess, episode or story, um, comes to console her, and she tells him about the wish principle, and then goes to make another wish and he's like no don't do it don't do it and and she does it anyway and i can't remember what specifically she wished Uh, she wished for him to be back is that what yeah she specifically wished for him to be back as he was before he left before the crash before the crash that's what it was right yes she wishes specifically to have him back and he, the financial advisor goes, no, wait, you know, if you wish him back, he'll come back all mangled and stuff, just like he was, you know, after the crash. You, you know, these things are very literal. And so she wishes specifically for to have him back as he was right before the crash, because they're all assuming he died from the crash. Right. And then you have some morticians, I guess, walk in uh, in full garb and top hats, you know, with the mist coming around them from the entrance. They put down to uh, you know uh, horses, you know the carpenters' horses, and then put down the casket, and he's inside the casket, and they go, oh, but he, we asked for him, you know, back as he was, and the guy turns around and says, what do you mean as he was? She's like, they're like, hey, he was mangled in a car crash, you know. He goes, he didn't die from the car crash; he died from a heart attack. So basically, it's revealed that because he was scared of the guy behind him, he had a heart attack, and then the crash happened afterwards. Yeah. So he's still dead. <laughs> so that's two wishes down. They yeah. Op- they open the casket. Sure enough, he's in there embalmed. <laughs> this is important. <laughs> this is a very important uh, thing to remember is that uh, our dead man here has been embalmed for the uh, funeral and burial process. Yeah. So... <laughs> Uh, the woman freaking out, going, "Oh, I just want him alive! I just want him alive! Uh, I I wish it for him to be alive and well forever." <laughs> now, the problem is she didn't clarify that she wanted him alive as he was before, not as he currently is. Right. And so he's revived, but he starts screaming horrendously and f- flailing about because. He was revived with a bunch of <laughs> embalming fluids in his veins. And he's no got, blood. He's got no blood. <laughs> and so he's in extreme pain, and he feels like it, everything's on fire, and he's screaming for mercy and whatever else. And then the woman freaking out. Uh, this wife is probably the most incompetent person in the room oh, by yeah. far. But <laughs> she grabs this like katana from their travels and... Yeah. Decides she's going to try to kill him again by slashing him with this katana (laughs) in the casket. Yeah. And all this does is, like, chop off his hands and stuff, and his hands are still moving because she wished for him to be alive forever, meaning he can't die. And his hands are moving and contorting, and he's moving and contorting in severe agony because she just not only brought him back with embalming fluid in his veins, but also hacked him to pieces. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and so uh, it just zooms in on her crying and him flailing about in the casket, you know, and the advisor just in shock and disbelief. And then they come back to the, the, the actual crypt. This is the problem that I have. If he was wished to be back forever and ever, he shouldn't actually be in there. He should yeah. He should still be like writhing in pain. For, for eternity. For, for eternity with embalming fluid in his veins, which, mind you, easy fix. Sew him back together and put blood in him. <laughs> My God. 
yeah. Like, if I get him blood, maybe he'll be fine. I, I mean, <laughs> options are pretty limited at that point. I mean, I, I think once you bring him back without any blood and encased in embalming fluid and his body's been decaying for some amount of time, you're probably fucked. <laughs> like, there's not much you can do now. Uh, but... Uh, <sighs> The, the, I agree. I had a big problem with this, <laughs> and it, the guy gets double fucked at the end. You know. Oh yeah. We'll get to that once we get past this last story here. But uh, I would assume that the financial advisor uses his wish to kill him. <laughs> That's what I would assume. <laughs> and then they just didn't make another wish because they realized how fucked it was. You know, if they made a like, wish. Yeah. If the guy gets his own set of wishes, then yeah, yeah. he probably could have wished for that guy to just. Rest in peace. Because basically, it's it, whoever holds it and makes the wishes has the three wishes or whatever. So right, I I can live with that. I can kind of <laughs> read between the lines and assume that's what happened. Can, can you live forever with that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> like I will never have that image not in my head now. Yeah, <laughs> forever. <laughs> So it's a mixed bag, to be sure. Yeah. Um, uh, like, that one, uh, definitely a little better told than, like, the very first one, but by far the least deserving of their ultimate fate in this entire thing. Yeah. And so we jump into the very last story, which features Major William Rogers, who... This one's kind of my favorite out of all of them. This one, <laughs> this one kind of reminded me of Saw. <laughs> I, I can't remember what the movie was, but there's this this movie where a blind guy. There's some kids that basically break into his house to rob him, and this blind guy I, I ends know up ex- hunting them down in his house. I know and exactly them what there. you're talking about. I can't remember what it's called, but it's like the blind guy, he he's the. Uh, the the very angry general from the movie Avatar. Yeah. So the guy I wish was Cable, but that's a <laughs> that's a discussion for another time. I I got that vibe mixed with Saw vibes by the end of this movie. Very strongly. There's a little bit of uh oh, what's his name? Uh played by Billy Bob Thornton. Sling Blade? Sling Blade, thank you. Yeah, I, th- I think oh the, the primary blind guy reminds me of Sling Blade a lot. <laughs> Especially in his mannerisms and how he speaks in monotone the entire time. Mm, she ought not to think such things. Mm. You're just a boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, basically, uh, the story revolves around this uh, major who's retired from the military who comes into becoming the director for this home of the blind uh, after the previous one leaves he has his you know beloved german shepherd that comes along with him and he admits you know he has no knowledge of what it's like to be blind and he has no knowledge of how to run this place but he assumes because he's a military man who's been a military man for 20 years and he he can get this place into ship shape and get the you know the budget just right and blah 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 and he immediately starts spending money on you know, <laughs> frivolous things like fancy paintings and decorate decorations for his office and special treats for his dog and you know big lavish dinners for himself and wine. You know, like I served in the military, I clearly deserve all of this. I mean, and this you- is exactly what officers would do, <laughs> <laughs> which is why nobody respects officers in the military half the time. Oh, you have y- you yeah. have the good ones, the really good ones, and they're good for a reason. But the, most of them are just assholes <laughs> entitled assholes yeah. with titles which is why everybody <laughs> looks to the senior enlisted people to get advice and learn how to do stuff yeah because the officers are just there to micromanage i guess i don't know <laughs> make sure people are doing what they're told so that they don't get chewed out for not making sure that the people aren't doing what they're told yeah <laughs> so the, the this guy uh starts doing things that are very detrimental to the lives of all the the blind patients in the in the ward and he basically cuts the heat at eight o'clock at night Ooh, i remember that that and so everybody basically starts freezing to death 
he won't pay for more blankets so um you know the ones that are most susceptible are really in trouble and the others are trying to sacrifice their blankets to try to keep them warm one becomes very ill uh, the food is cut you know there's basically they, there's no meat in any of the food and it's basically just you know very piss poor you know soup <laughs> uh, that is being fed to them and only a single serving nothing more because you know he cut the funds for all that meanwhile he's eating these lavish dinners in his office oh yeah and the main blind man that's kind of the focus of the story he confronts him several times in his office about the conditions, and the man just kind of blows him off. This says, guy, I kept calling Doc Brown because, <laughs> like the the way the the look, this guy's face and his hair definitely gave me uh, Doc Brown vibes. Yeah, and so uh, basically things build to a, a climax when one of the more fragile inmates dies from becoming ill from freezing and being underfed uh, in these terrible conditions. And even when he's dying, the main character, the main blind man goes to get him to call a doctor. And the man makes a big fuss about how late it is and doesn't want to call a doctor. And then finally he convinces him to go look and discovers that the man has died from the illness because he refused to treat him and all that. And he just kind of, blows it off and thinks nothing of it and goes back to business as usual um you you think he has a moment of reflection there but it doesn't seem like it in the end nope um which means he's probably among the more deserving of the, the the group here um and this kind of forms this weird kind of uh coalition of conspiratory usurpers within the blind man uh regiment here and they all... Oh, they formed a gang. They, don't don't they, give me that organized <laughs> bullshit. These guys <laughs> got together, decided that they were fed up with what this uh, army general was having to put them through, i.e. being made to freeze nearly to death at night and being fed nothing but this like soupy bullshit. Yeah. They, they were fed up. And they formed a gang, and they they came up with a revenge so obvious the second that they started like building things. And the, visually, I was thrown for a loop, especially when it came to all of these blind people just uh, picking up tools and yeah. like I. I there's, I some, saw, there's seemingly some leaps in logic with uh, how things end up, but. Y- yeah, but th- these blind people were fucking fierce. Oh yeah. my god! I mean, those you, canes. You though. gotta wonder how they became blind. Maybe it was in the war or something because <laughs> they were fucking ready to go. Yeah, they were. <laughs> uh, but basically, they hatched this whole scheme. The one thing that kind of keeps them at bay is the dog, because they're scared of the dog. Yeah, and so they hatch a scheme where they may leave a trail of bacon that they saved from the morning. Um, and lead the dog into a trap. And basically, there's these two rooms in the basement. That they're little cells with barred windows. And they lure the dog in there and trap the dog in one of the rooms. And then they go and confront the the major and, <laughs> and with their gang, basically yeah. abduct him and drag <laughs> him into the other room and lock him in there as well. And basically, they're both in there for several days while they build <laughs> this <laughs> very strange maze, w- w- which is giving you all the saw vibes, you know? Oh, yeah. They build this big maze using wood from the basement and various parts of the hospital that they just tore out and stuff like that. <laughs> that traps the general uh, in this kind of U shape that connects to the door where his dog is. And they're in there for days, and he's yelling at them to feed his dog, and blah blah blah, and how he's asking for food, and begging for you know forgiveness, and blah blah blah. And finally, uh, <laughs> they get to a point where they have my favorite line in this entire film, where he goes, "Please, you have to feed the dog. He's ravenous." 
And they go, oh, he'll be fed. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you worry, Major. <laughs> Your dog will be fed. <laughs> and so, it it yeah. was then that I knew this one was my favorite. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, they eventually, after several days, they stop, you know, pounding. They actually had to abduct another one of the doctors just to keep him from saving the major. <laughs> yeah. That, so that, that was when they got their most gang like because they yeah. snuck up, captured the doctor, then proceeded to like lead the doctor back into a room where they completely closed him off. Yeah, <laughs> just to get him out of the equation. And uh, <laughs> they open the door for the maze, and so he goes through it. It's dark. He can't really see. He doesn't really hear anything. Again, I think the the analogy here is kind of harkening back to an earlier discussion they have. Again, please watch this if you haven't watched this, because this is probably the best story. Oh, yeah. Um I have a talk earlier in the the story where the main blind man tells him, hey, all of your senses are intensified when you become blind. You're hearing, you can hear insects crawling across the floor because things aren't clean. You can you feel the cold like razors on your skin, you know, because it's so intense. You know, your food, when it's bad, it tastes so much more worse because it's intensified uh, and all this other stuff. Well, now he's depriving the general of his <laughs> various senses in different ways. Yeah. And so he goes through this little maze, and they kind of play mind games with him by giving him an out, an out, and then they shut the door and lock it before <laughs> he can get to it and that sort of thing and just mess with him. And then eventually he gets to this corridor that's filled with razor blades. When life gives you razor blades, you make a corridor... And coat that corridor in <laughs> razor blades. Now, I refuse to believe that this fucking maze that these blind people put up <laughs> in the span of like two days or three days, whatever it was, was so structurally like sound <laughs> that he couldn't just find a way to break out of it without going through the razor blades. Or, or to like kick one of the walls yeah. over or something. I mean, something. it was like chicken wire <laughs> that was overhead. And, I mean, he was an older guy, but he, 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 clearly he was spry enough to uh, figure out a way. An old man can still like kick something with at least a believable amount of force. Yeah, so I was... <laughs> I was like, well, once you get to the corridor of razor blades, you should probably assume that you're going to die if you don't <laughs> do something else. Uh, it, yes. But uh, he decides, I'm just going to follow the path they gave me, because clearly this isn't a trap. Uh, so he, it's very, very narrow, and he, he's cutting himself the whole way through. Increasingly narrow as he goes on. Again, very much a Saw vibe, you know, the Saw movies. Uh, oh, yeah. He finally gets through, and then he turns the corner, and he sees the door where his dog is. And then he kind of realizes what's going to happen. They throw the door open, and his dog, is, which is ravenous and crazy now at this point with hunger, charges out and uh, chases him down. And he runs away, and obviously <laughs> he's got that corridor of razor blades, and either dog's going to eat you or you're going to crash to this cord over razor blades as fast as you can he crunches into it screams and then the dog gets him anyway it was at the moment in which you saw a string pulling on the latch to open the door to the dog that again i said oh no <laughs> <laughs> he did folks i was sitting here listening to him yep that was man that was a moment caught between a dog and a hall full of razor, razor blades literally most likely turning yourself into a uh, much easier to eat meat for that dog <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it was uh probably probably the best one of the group as far as what the story was oh yeah um like the most this one was like the main character was a villain and he did everything he could to fucking deserve it yeah like, they they all have leaps of logic in some way shape or form yeah um but this one was definitely the one that kind of engrossed you the most uh, it kind of i feel like a lot of movies are influenced by this you know i i was getting you know 
one flew over the cuckoo's nest oh, vibes yeah. when they're in the cafeteria. <laughs> you know, I was getting a lot of saw vibes from the hallway. You know, the the maze scene. I was getting the, the just all sorts of various like flashbacks to all of these different films you know from this one story in this movie this one story that manages to feature so many different things that other movies like focused on like one part of it but this story had all of those things yeah and, and the villain in this case probably deserved it i don't i don't think if he had to rank them he would deserve it more than the woman who murdered her loving husband while her daughter was upstairs he's Um, a very close number two i the guy who you know terrorized this poor old man until he committed suicide it's like he wasn't the one that killed him necessarily and that's the reason why he's a he he's number three yeah but narrowly you know is it whereas the major is directly responsible for the death of the the old man because he refused to give them blankets and turn the heat on and was giving them yeah too little food while he was living it up he wasn't he wasn't trying to kill them but he was actively making them suffer for his own gain yeah and so we get to the big finale uh, with the Crypt Keeper, basically, they're all realizing more or less that this is what they did that got them there. And that this isn't just some tour that they happen to wander into. This is, you know, basically the bridge to hell. <laughs> yeah. It was like his purpose is finally revealed in that the reason why they were all here to reflect on their lives or the reasons for their demise was so that they could be reminded of why they're going to be here for all eternity. Yeah. So this is this is the point of the film where it gets a little silly. And it, it gave me a really strong <laughs> the meaning of life vibes from oh, Honey Python. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they're kind of like on the cosmos. <laughs> uh, and like a few of them just... They open the doorway, and a few of them just run right in and jump into the abyss, <laughs> you know, and go straight to hell. Yeah. Whereas, like, I think, like, maybe two of them stayed behind and was like, well, maybe we don't have to do this. Like, <laughs> should we just sit here and not jump into the fiery pits of hell? <laughs> like, um, I think I'm good where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I got, Whereas, like, I'll the hang fr- out with you, Crypt Keeper. <laughs> the- I, I, are you hiring? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, the first one that uh, manages to like fall into a very, uh, I don't want to say poorly, uh, <coughs> poorly crafted volcano for this shot, but man, the, the, the life of Brian is, I think, being a little generous. <laughs> oh, meaning of life. Yeah, meaning of life. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was <laughs> it was it was very over the top and corny and campy. But it's the seventies, early seventies. Yeah, what do you he, expect? Yeah, this was like before the time of the Wilhelm scream, so you actually got to hear this guy's very own personal. Ah! Yeah. By the way, can we kill the Wilhelm screams? <laughs> really don't want those anymore. Uh, the worst. Uh, no, that that's that's stock footage. Damn it. <laughs> But uh, everyone gets to use it. Uh, the worst. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if, this is the part where I was really feeling bad for the businessman. Because again, not only was it not his fault, the, you know, anything that happened, it was just a luck of the draw that the, the, the funds went bad and he went into debt. He wasn't the one who made the stupid wishes. It was his dumb wife. <laughs> <laughs> and he was already made to suffer by being brought back from the dead yeah. while having embalming fluid in his yeah. system. He, he, he died from a heart attack. It's not like, <laughs> you know, he, he was in the m- middle of murdering somebody, you know, like the first woman or anything. He didn't terrorize anybody. He was doing the honorable thing by selling everything he owned <laughs> in order to pay off the debts and make sure people didn't get screwed. He was doing everything he should have done. And he, he already had been made to, su- in spite of all of that, he had already been made to suffer from beyond the grave. Yes, you would think <laughs> that would count as time served or something. <laughs> <laughs> he got brought back to life with embalming fluid in him and then got hacked to pieces by his stupid wife while in the casket. 
I, I'm going to count that as penance. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the uh, fuck, man? What like, does this guy got to do? Uh, like, And I would say that is even cruel and unusual, considering that the only thing that he did, it, it just involved money. He didn't, hurt, like, go out and murder someone. He didn't torture someone to the point of death. He didn't put someone through harsh conditions to the point of death. Yeah. He just he just mismanaged money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, like he, he even tried to fix it. He even tried to fix it, which is better than most fucking stockbrokers. Guys, what the... Our president <laughs> deserves worse based on the number of times he's declared bankruptcy alone. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was... I felt so bad for this fucking guy. <laughs> like, I felt bad for some... Like, I don't think any of them deserve an eternity in hell or anything like that, you know? I, I mean... I, uh, sure, the lady. suffering. Uh, the, the, the lady. An eternity, though? That's a long-ass uh, time. Uh, uh, okay. Based on what that kid probably had to go through as a result, <laughs> I would have said... Yeah, She's yeah. the one who let Santa in! <laughs> uh, okay. She is a child! She probably got murdered by Santa, too. Which helps me stand by my statement. That lady <laughs> deserves an eternity for having a child probably killed by an insane Santa Claus. <laughs> uh, the rest of them, uh, give, give them like a hundred years. I, don't I know guess that answers years. the question from Nightmare Before Christmas. <laughs> Santa Claus is scarier <laughs> than anything in Halloween Town. Oh, no. <laughs> Get the Sandy Claus. So, uh, what is this Sandy Claus? I have to see him. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I yeah you feel bad for the the two characters, especially you know the <laughs> the one who you know made a mistake and tried to run away from his life because he fell in love with some young tart or whatever the case is, you know. Y- yeah, it happens, you know. Like it's terrible. He probably shouldn't have done it. He knew he was wrong, cause, which is why he goes back to the original family first, right? You know, because he realizes his mistake. <laughs> It was but, like he, he literally felt as though he all he cheated death, and the first thing that he does is go and realizes that, um, I want to be with my family. Yeah, I want to be with my family. I fucked up. I want to be with my family. Who the fuck is that in my house? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't. He definitely doesn't deserve something that severe. And then the fucking business guy did nothing wrong and got tortured. <laughs> And the act, all due to things that he was not in control of. <laughs> right. At all. And he still gets thrown into the pit to hell. And then we get the big ending from the the, the knighted one himself. Yes. And now, who's next? Perhaps you. You. <laughs> 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 Yeah. That organ is brutal, by the way. If, <laughs> if you haven't watched this movie already, and why haven't you? We've been telling you. There's a free links out there. Just yeah. Google watch Tales from the Crypt 1972, and you'll get several options to watch. The Daily Motion is probably the best quality. The YouTube one's the quickest because it doesn't take forever to load. But yeah, uh, any we post this stuff on our social there. media. Watch it. <laughs> yeah, any of you people out there who are at least trying to act as though quarantine is still being followed. Um, <laughs> You've got time. Go and watch this movie. Yeah, Come it's on. worth it. It's yeah. worth it. Um, the just skip the the whole organ introduction. It's so long. <laughs> it's they like, play the whole fucking musical movement. It's like ten minutes of this guy just soloing the organ <laughs> and shredding. Man, just <laughs> Just is it a solo if he's the thing only ever. one playing? And then the outro is the same thing. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> like, it would be one thing if you just used it in the intro, but the outro, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's so obnoxious. It's worse than the fucking barking dogs that happened for 10 minutes in Superman and the Mole Men. God. Just, that that <laughs> segment was brutal, <laughs> but this was worse. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, overall, what'd you think, Emery? Uh, if you had to put it on a grade scale, what would you give it? On a grade scale, I am going to give this, I'm going to say a C plus. 
C plus. Uh, I think that's fair. Yeah. I'm going to go a little higher. I actually thought, especially for the time, is very creative filmmaking. Yeah. I actually like the kind of format, you know, the very Twilight Zone format with the, the groups of people. Of course, they did it multiple times, so it wasn't exactly original at that point. Right. Um, I actually think everybody acted their part pretty well. I don't think anybody drastically overacted like tended to be the case in right. you know, 60s and 70s media. Uh, I actually think it was all pretty well done with the exception of the musical score <laughs> uh, and, and spots and how abrasive some of the screams are um, to a, you know modern listeners ears. You know, some of the effects could have been better, but it was a really low budget film, relatively speaking. You know, it's you can't hold it that much against them. So I I want to give it a B. I actually you, I think it was uh, pretty, a, a solid B. A solid B. I think you know trying to grade it on a curve for what it was at the time and everything and for like whether i'd go back to watch it again absolutely i was actually enjoying yeah. listening to you watch it <laughs> you know even though i wasn't watching it literally i was yeah. enjoying reliving it while you were watching it so yeah. yeah absolutely i would sit down and watch this again superman the moment uh, yeah. yeah i watched it once i watched it twice <laughs> and i didn't want to watch it twice <laughs> you know batman 1966 i know that's your vibe but i don't want to watch it again <laughs> <laughs> that movie's so fucking stupid. Uh, uh, ho- hold on. Uh, these men are engaging in what could be the most important work. <laughs> Let's make our way out the window discreetly. <laughs> I, I, no, j- again, just a minute. It's going to take a minute. It was to intentionally open this thing. dumb and stupid and silly. So I, yeah. I'm forgiving of it. I get it, but it's <laughs> not what I needed. Oh, God. Mm <laughs> hmm. Uh, but yeah, I actually like this quite a bit. I, I enjoyed this far more than the other two we've watched so far. So I, I give it a solid B. Again, I'm graving on a curve because of when it was filmed, when it was produced. It was a low budget film. You know, there's a lot of things going into this. So, uh, you know, take it with a grain of salt. You know, if you're trying to hold it up to modern filmmaking standards and all that, it's probably not going to hold up. But I oh. think it's worth a watch. And I, oh, I did yeah. enjoy watching yeah. it. So Yeah, I would say that... Uh this is definitely worth a watch. Uh, the places where I am taking points off are the while there are leaps in logic that were made, there are also, as we kind of talked about in depth, there are like at least a couple of people that don't deserve yeah. their fate in this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the hardest thing in like horror films. I get it adds like a little bit of extra tension if the innocent ones are still still sentenced. Still. Still liable for the fates that yeah. are bestowed to the various characters in any horror film. Yeah. But it always kind of sucks <laughs> <laughs> when you're watching somebody who clearly doesn't deserve what's happening to them or anything close to it. Yeah. Get brutally murdered, like in Saw or something, you know? Yeah. I, I think that's the, the point of the horror is that while like some of it is just like gruesome and gory and whatnot there there is that psychological bit of it where like you think that that i i wish i could save that person that person yeah. doesn't deserve that fate um let me reset real quick but yeah um i would say that there were at least a few places here that uh honestly seemed like it was going like the long way around to get to the points of these stories yeah like specifically with the the guy who goes out of his way to completely demean an innocent old man (laughs) (laughs) when if i were that guy i could i could get that guy to move in one fell swoop and that is to make the accusation that anyone of the modern time would easily make. Pedophile. Pedophile. <laughs> it's like, how do I, I get this popsicle? guy? I got one in my cellar. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Herbert, sir. <laughs> 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 that, like, that, that is the thing with that story. Uh, the thing with the monkey's paw We've gone into like a thousand different reasons why that guy should have been spared yeah. having to deal with the fucking crypt keeper. That yeah. guy suffered enough. I'm okay with like <laughs> quote unquote innocent people getting fucked up or having a terrible fate if it's like 
clear in the situation that it doesn't matter what you did or what you didn't do you know right uh, this thing is coming after everybody like alien for example you know alien's gonna go around killing everything it doesn't matter if right. you're a good it, person or a bad person it, it's a know. mindless xenomorph you it, might be rooting for somebody but it's not a big deal if somebody innocent dies you know right in this it's clearly that like the, set that this is a judgment platform and that these people yes. are being judged for their sins and not <laughs> repenting for what they did or not having the chance to repent in a lot of cases. Right. It's like the, the case for this one guy's repentance was not made clear. And if yeah. anything else, uh, like if anything, this guy seemed as though he had gone through penance of a sort <laughs> like yeah. before even having to deal with the Crypt Keeper. I mean, uh, honestly, of all the people, the only one that really got a chance to try to repent is the guy that terrorized the old man. The old man gave him an entire year to, <laughs> to repent for what he did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he didn't. Yeah, no. <laughs> so that guy's like ultra fucked. <laughs> <laughs> but the woman was murdered right away the night that she committed the murder. Yeah. Uh, Let's see here. The the guy crashed his car before he even committed the sin completely when he was still <laughs> having doubts and thinking about going back to his family. You know, yeah. he still had a chance to prevent everything that was going to happen, you know, or or at the very least, at some point after he had safely gotten out of that car, yeah. uh, say, you know what? I made a mistake. This is all wrong. Um can I please come back home? <laughs> <laughs> the businessman we already established didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> so there's nothing to <laughs> repent for. No. Not that he had the chance either because he had a heart attack immediately. Yeah, no, this man, it just, this man was just terribly unlucky <laughs> <laughs> the entire way through. It's brutal, man. <laughs> and then the the major, I, I guess you could say, kind of had a chance to redeem himself after the guy died, but like they planned to kill him almost immediately so like uh, yeah there's not a whole lot of time he had but the guy with the year that guy's like pff. yeah <laughs> <laughs> goodbye yeah nah fuck him <laughs> uh yeah. but i i kind of think everybody in that town deserves to be in that room to be honest a little bit Pro probably more than some of them <laughs> oh yeah because they were all complicit yeah especially the old guy whether it was his dad or somebody else i don't know who he was oh yeah that entire town deserves to be in there way more than the unlucky financier yeah so again i gave it a, a solid b i actually enjoy watching it i would be happy to watch it again and Emery gives I, it a c plus yes a c plus c plus all right so we're putting it in the database and that gives us an average of a B minus, which is now officially the highest ranked movie in our comic movie master list. Tales from the Crypt running away with that number one spot for right now. So as of right now, according to our standards <laughs> of three films, <laughs> three films in chronological order, Tales from the Crypt circa 1972 is the greatest comic book film of all time. Easily. <laughs> <laughs> We're on an upward trend so far. Oh, yeah. We started with a D-plus average to a C-plus average to a B-minus. These things have only gotten better. <laughs> now, I would like to say that I believe that we're going to continue this upward trend and we're going to keep going strong and the film industry is going to become stronger. The comic book industry is going to become stronger and everybody's going to celebrate because by the time we get to the modern day, the movies will be pristine and amazing. But <laughs> about that, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the next movie on our list was not as critically well received as uh, <laughs> Tales from the Crypt was. Yeah. The next one will also be based on EC Comics, and it is called Vault of Horror, <laughs> <laughs> which is also the title of an EC Comics book. However, none of the stories are from <laughs> the Vault of Horror series. They're all from Tales of the Crypt or uh, some of the other uh, lines they had at EC Comics in the 50s and 40s. Much like that switcheroo we were talking about very much earlier. Which is very ironic. Actually, uh, depending on what market you were in, it's actually called Tales from the Crypt 2 in a lot of markets, which is probably oh. far more appropriate. Far more. Uh, Vault of Horror doesn't even sound like on its face related to Tales of the Crypt. No. And Vault of Horror was released a year later, so 
very quick after uh, the release of Tales from the Crypt. They were still pumping out all of these horror movies. Now, again, they had tons of them. And they're all in the same format, kind of some kind of anthology collection of stories. Yeah. So it's it's weird that they didn't just get a TV show <laughs> uh, to produce, you know, like a Twilight Zone of their own in the 70s. I'm sure it would have been popular, but um, surprising that they made each of these feature like films. But, you know, I guess I'm thankful they did because we get to review them now. Yeah. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and start wrapping it up. This will be our uh, only episode for this week, uh, just because we're, again, in quarantine, so there's no point in putting out another podcast. Um, I don't know. I've been reading uh, some Daphne Byrne, uh, no. which is a black label title from uh, DC Comics. I read issues one through four. It's I. <laughs> <laughs> it's written by Joe Hill, partially. There's two writers on it, <clears throat> but I picked it up because Joe Hill's writing it. Joe Hill... Uh, wrote uh, lock and key of course which i really love right but uh daphne Byrne is just not working for me uh, uh it's it's kind of incoherent it's taking way too long to get to the point like <laughs> what's the point of all this you know like oh there's a mystery but there's still a mystery episode three there's a mystery issue four there's a mystery like oh my god what the fuck is a mystery it's like okay <laughs> the artwork is r- kind of bad like Joe Hill and the people he works with are typically very good, but this this is not their best work. Art, um, artwork's not up to par. You know, and there's there's threads there, but I feel like issue one through four could have easily been just issue one <laughs> if, if it was condensed and made more coherent. Yeah. And then we could get to the fucking point by issue two. Uh, so, yeah, I, I probably won't keep reading it, you know, depending on what my selections are in the future, but... Unfortunately, I can't recommend Daphne Byrne for those out there looking for a new kind of horror theme title or black label title. I did take your advice and I read uh, the question. Yeah. Uh, really enjoy the aesthetic. I, ish- I read issue one too. Uh, I don't know how far you are in it. Um, I'm not sure. I like where it's going. It it kind of took a a Batman, <laughs> you know, Curse of the White Knight part little, two little, <laughs> vibe a little bit uh it uh got supernatural in a weird way and yeah. the, they're bringing i'm not gonna spoil anything but they brought up names from batman lore that are kind of unnecessary it, it's kind of inescapable because it's dc comics and they renamed the character three times in two issues already <laughs> so uh it's i well To give people an idea of what this comic is about, the full title of the book in question is The Question, The Deaths of Vic Sage. Yeah, so I don't know if they're going for a reincarnation type of thing. I don't know if... Mm. This isn't... Long Uh, story short, this isn't what I'm looking for from the question. Uh, Right. I mean... I'm reading it because, quite frankly, I am starved for the question <laughs> stories. The, the character has so much fucking potential, and no one knows what to fucking do with him. Yeah, I agree with you. Ugh. I think the question is an awesome character, and people certainly don't use him enough. Uh, but it's... I don't know if I like where this is going. The artwork's cool. It's very... yeah. It's perfect for a noir type of character. Um, but I don't think they're... That they, they, they kind of stepped off of the noir way. path, yeah. story wise. So, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to think. I don't um, know what, uh, I've read through issue two. I haven't read issue three yet. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if issue three is out. I have to check I think, that. I think it was after the freeze for diamond but uh yeah so that's pretty much all the like, stuff i've jumped into i've been getting myself set to play final fantasy 7 remake basically i'm making a romantic event of it basically <laughs> whining and dining myself i had one <laughs> game that i haven't finished ahead of it on my hard drive that i'm forcing myself to finish so i can delete it off my hard drive it's assassin's creed origins because I know if I drop it, I will never go back to this fucking game. <laughs> <laughs> and I will never get to continue with the Assassin's Creed games because I'll be... 
I will have a mental barrier from wanting to pursue the future games because I haven't finished the a previous one. Th- this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is a classic case of the sunk cost fallacy. Yeah. Uh, uh, whereas I have already come to the conclusion that I don't want to play the Assassin's Creed games anymore. <laughs> they, that, the, that studio has gotten enough of my money. It would just... They have gone so far off of the meta narrative that they were supposed to be on track with that it, it, they don't even know where the fuck they're going anymore. No, it's it, it's really painfully obvious they don't know what the fuck to do anymore. Yeah, I mean, I mean the gameplay's fun enough, but the grind is brutal. It's just so boring, and they just give you so much shit that you have to do to even be reasonable. Yeah, for those of you wondering exactly which game he's talking about, he he's pl- playing Assassin's Creed Origins, or as I like to call it, Dark Souls Creed of Egypt. Yeah, uh, it's just, it's so fucking tedious, and the characters are so unlikable because they're all hypocrites. <laughs> they're all hypocrites, and, and your main, your main, like the main character that you're playing as uh has a story kind of similar to Kratos. Yeah, he's going around murdering everybody for <laughs> the smallest fucking things, including like, you know, accidentally desecrating a mummy and like, you know, killing an alligator who was apparently owned by a sacred god and it's just stupid shit, you know? <laughs> Meanwhile, he's hunting down all of these members of this order and killing them one by one because he stabbed his own son (laughs) they didn't stab his son he stabbed his fucking son and now now he hates them all because they put him in the situation to stab his son yeah i mean let's get down literally the entire narrative from beginning to end he is talking about how they killed his son they killed his son meanwhile he's never realizing that hey i killed my son (laughs) (laughs) it's my fault (laughs) Uh, I I mean, let's be real here. Yes, sure, he might have brought his blade to his son, but who brought his son to his blade, though? <laughs> his son. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh hi. Son. Oh my God. I I think I might have killed you, son. Yeah. There's a lot to like about the game. That, I mean, it's not Assassin's Creed anymore. I mean, you don't even get a hidden blade until like you know hours and hours into the game and the thing doesn't even fucking work and they give yeah and you have to level it up or else it doesn't fucking kill anybody and it's just i just hate a lot of <laughs> what it it wants to be what it's trying to be it's awesome going to cyrene and to you know alexandria and cairo and all of these different places you know and seeing the pyramids of giza and seeing the older pyramids and all the old temples and all this stuff it's tourism but yeah it, like, like it's I could murderous do, tourism did i just do a virtual tour i think you did <laughs> and just not have all the bullshit in between you know <laughs> not have like bandits attacking me every 10 fucking minutes and, you know and i can't run away from them because i'll fucking die <laughs> <laughs> and so I have to take the 20 minutes to fucking murder every single one of these guys on horseback and half of them are glitching through rocks so I can't fucking murder them but they can still shoot me like just stupid shit I've <laughs> It's so terrible. And then his wife is worse. Like his, his, his wife is Captain Marvel, basically. And they just... I, they, you want to like her, but they just force her in all of these ridiculous situations constantly. You know? It's, just, it's fine, but... His wife is totally Captain Marvel. The th- the th- she is. She's the worst. And now it's like... I'm thinking about the next game, which is critically acclaimed by a lot of people, and supposedly they get rid of a lot of the tedious things, except the grind. Apparently the grind is worse than ever. But they get rid of a lot of the tedious things that were in Origins, which, you know, is welcome to hear, uh, whether it's true or not, who knows. But the game is set 300 fucking years before the origin story of the Assassins. So, (laughs) what what the fuck is she doing? (laughs) So, it wasn't an origin story? Like, about that. <laughs> Stupid. Um, they just don't know what the fuck they're doing anymore. Not only do they not know what they're doing, um, I mean, it should be 
very, very obvious based on the fact that you don't really cut away to the modern day anymore. Yeah, I mean, there's a modern day story in this. It, I would. This is one of the complimentary things I would say, actually, is that the modern day story in this game has been better than it's been since like Assassin's Creed Four. Because after Desmond's dead, like in Assassin's Creed Three, spoiler for a game that's like 15 years old. I don't know how old it is. Pretty old. Yeah, but it's an old fucking game, and it got like rebooted like several times. So you can still play it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, ever since he died, the the overarching narrative that makes you invested in what you are doing has been kind of stripped away and you were just some generic Abstergo employee for every other game. Yeah. And sometimes uh, like, there'd be some cameos from the old crew, you know, but yeah. that's more or less all it was is a cameo and you kind of loosely follow what's going on with them. Yeah. In the meantime, the original idea being the, okay, there are these weird, like over God things that are, and have been dealing with humanity. I mean, on the map, they show one in Australia, in yeah. the center of Australia. Oh, my I'm God. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, right. Let's see Aboriginal Creed. I fucking Fuck. dare them. <laughs> I can't fucking wait. <laughs> <laughs> Every game's been in Europe or some you know colony of Europe. Uh, oh, my God. If I mean, they even, did... even this one is in Egypt but it's colonized by the Greeks and being conquered by the Romans. So it's like, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? It, like it's, uh, it's Next up, we get Vikings. Yes, a Viking creed. <laughs> <laughs> or, or creed of war, because I'm assuming they're just going uh, to go god of war with this one. Yeah. Uh, I, it's, I don't know. And yeah. they're making the gods like way too literal now. Uh, it seems uh, like okay. they restrain Do, themselves and uh, they and origins, but it it oh. seems like the whole plot of the the Odyssey is supernatural. Oh like, y- y- yeah, the supernatural creatures and all that shit. Just they're, make it a different series. Yeah, <laughs> it's yes. not Assassin's Creed anymore. It it literally isn't. I don't even think they have a hidden blade in Odyssey. It's they're not assassins, yeah, because the, they don't exist yet. Yeah, right. It, it, the origins is three hundred years later. It, it's based fucking, on the previous game. It's fucking Spartan Creed. That's so dumb. <sighs> and yeah. which the writers of the game have gone out of their way to say playing as the woman is canon. You know, because that's fine. that. Fucking, but why give you a choice? Just right. Why would you even give us a choice? If, it, it's <laughs> like if you're going to make the woman canon, just make us play as the woman. That's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Tomb Raider and fucking Resident Evil Three are a thing, guys. What the? F- oh yeah, my god. Uh, it, but it's I'm done stupid. griping. I'm done griping. It's <laughs> uh, are you done? But I'm because for- I, I think I might. I, this, I might have a few more. This game is so fucking long, and it's taking me forever to get through. I dumped so many hours into so many tedious fucking bullshit things to get through this fucking game so I can at least have the story. I'm sure I could watch a video or something, but I feel like I'd just be cheating myself if I did that and rob myself of the context, you know? It, so, yeah. I'm forcing myself to finish this game, but yeah. And I've Turn your character into an Egyptian Power Ranger. There's, there's Assassin's Creed games that I've just not enjoyed, like Syndicate, as much as I wanted to enjoy it. It, it kind of had the San Andreas, like, you know, Free up the gang territory type of things. You know, oh, you Grand mean Theft Auto, a, San Andreas, a, a, assassin by gaslight. Yeah, and, <laughs> but it was so glitchy, <laughs> and it just looked bad. Like there was just terrible textures and frame it, drops, and it, like the, clearly this is this was the pinnacle of the year to year plan not working out. <laughs> yeah, that that one was very much rushed. Yeah, so it just it was bad. Uh, you know, Assassin's Creed Three was boring but i wouldn't say it was bad you know it was cool context cool characters you know it connor, sounds like connor a... was boring after having Ezio for three games but you know, yeah that's Ezio's a, a really thing. fucking hard character to live up to yeah <laughs> and i mean like i thought it was actually a pretty solid game it introduced the kind of ship combat that became the focus point of the next game which is probably, pirates creed you know my second favorite after that <laughs> you know yeah. my favorite is actually assassin's creed rogue yeah um, which i yeah if only it had a little bit of desmond still alive to just drive the main narrative but uh yeah th- that's the thing that kills me about the se- about that series is that well 
the point of the entire thing hinged on Desmond. But he's dead now. <laughs> and he's been dead for a long time. Yeah. Like yeah, now- it doesn't seem like there's a, really a point in any of this stuff. I mean, they keep harping on this, you know, predecessor race woman who is somehow in the computers and like recreating herself somehow through the the order of ancients you know which is apparently separate from templars but still linked to the templars trying to recreate these people and it's it's meta narrative gobbledygook mumbo jumbo just to get you to but the sass- appreciate yeah. the the modern the modern day part of the story but as the- opposed to just waiting for the moment to jump back into history. Yeah, but the problem is it just strips the assassins of any meeting in the modern day because there's not any good assassins left. There's like one, (laughs) and he's old. (laughs) (laughs) But you see, the point of the entire game was the friends that we made along the way or that the assassin was inside you all along. I mean, the bleeding effect is very convenient. <laughs> it's a very complainant, convenient plot device. I don't know if the woman from the modern day is in the, the next game. I hope she is, so we can actually have somebody to focus on for the main narrative again before they were doing this weird like first-person thing where you were the employee, and it was just very awkward. It didn't work. Right. But uh, I'm hoping they have somebody to actually focus on going forward. But, yeah, that's it. And then after that, I'm going to play the... Uh, you know, original Final Fantasy VII portion of the game in Midgar again, which I, I've said this before, I play it probably at least once a year and beat it at least once a year just because I love that game so much. It's my favorite game of all time. So I'm going to play the Midgar stuff just to refresh my memory, and then I'm going to jump into the remake after that. I'm going to give you some fair warning. That uh, the remake is padded. I I mean, <laughs> it, it <laughs> took like the first six to ten hours of the game, <laughs> which is a huge game, and made it into one video game. I'm I'm not gonna be expecting anything less than a ton of padding and loading and side quests and all sorts of bullshit. So they stretched it. I'm sure <laughs> it's thick. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I've heard nothing but good things overall. The, the um, combat is fantastic. Yeah, and I love oh the demo. God. I told myself I wouldn't play the demo because I wanted to go into it completely fresh, but I I couldn't restrain myself. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, I played the demo and I fucking loved it. So oh yeah, I am so looking forward to that. So have you been into any nerd culture, reading any books or anything, just to update the fans before we send them off? Uh well, I and. Uh, the reason why I'm able to fair warning you with the Final Fantasy thing is because I have also been playing Final Fantasy VII Remake, and my god, once I started that game, I have not been able to put that game down in days. Beautiful. <laughs> it, it, it is... I think the thing I'm most scared of... So engrossing. ...is beating that game, platinuming everything, getting every side quest and doing every little thing. And then realizing it's probably going to be seven fucking years before I see another <laughs> entry. <laughs> oh, I certainly hope not. They'll have to probably replace the entire voice cast again. <laughs> yeah. I've been hearing that there's some controversy about how they ended it, though. Yeah. I don't know the context. I, I haven't gotten I, there I don't yet. want to know the context, but uh, I've yeah. heard some people are unhappy with the ending. Yeah. Uh uh, I haven't gotten there yet, but from what I hear, apparently the writers of that game are focusing on getting it back to the narrative as we know it. We'll see. We'll see. I mean, <laughs> L- let's just if you lived up to so much expectation, it would be a real shame if you just fucked it all up at the end. <laughs> 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 we'll see, though. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot that they have lived up to. There's a lot that they've improved and expanded upon. And then there's some additions that not only was I not expecting, but sometimes I'm like, wait, what, no, that, wh- what? No, don't. That, 
I, I mean, I guess that makes sense, but fine. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I think we'll go ahead and send you off. Just as a reminder, it is now the number one rated movie. Tales from the Crypt. Movie master list. Number one being Tales from the Crypt. Number two being Batman circa 1966. And number three being 1951's Superman and the Mole Men. Um, The next movie on our list is 1973's Vault of Horror, based on the EC comics. Not of the same title, (laughs) as we discussed earlier. It's actually based on another title, which is Tales from the Crypt, which is what we just watched. And some markets it's called Tales from the Crypt 2 for that reason. Electric Boogaloo. So uh, <laughs> make sure you look forward to that. I will be posting the links if I can find any free ones for you on our social medias. So make sure you keep an eye on those and like and subscribe on those so you can actually uh, get the update when it's there. And then you can watch it and uh, review it with us next week. Um, so without further ado, thank you very much for watching. Remember, we got a Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash hit the books. You can find us on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash or uh, nope at HTB vids. There we go. Facebook.com forward slash hit the books. Uh, our website is htbvids.com where you can find links to all of the stuff as well as uh, some uh, further information for, you know, previous comics uh, of the week, as far as the covers of the week and variants covers of the week, yeah, all sorts of stuff. It's late. I'm tired. I'm slurring, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thank you very much for watching. We really do love and appreciate you. Uh, hopefully you'll stick around and join us for another episode. Uh, Again, we'll be recording a comic book movie master list episode next week and not a a normal episode of Hit the Books podcast unless something very significant happens and we just have to talk about it for some amount of time. So uh, at least until this uh, quarantine lifts up a little bit and Diamond starts distributing again, which is slated for May 20th, um, look forward to more of these comic movie master lists as more of the feature of the 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 channel for a little while uh if uh you have a problem with that or you'd still like to hear our weekly podcast you know give us an email uh hit the books vids at gmail.com or uh talk to us on our social medias anything like that we're actually very responsive if uh, we see your message even on our youtube channel uh so feel free to reach out if you uh have a preference in a different way or you'd like to see some other content all right so with that we love you we wish you well we hope you're healthy out there and washing your hands and all that jazz Signing off. Au revoir. Farewell. Auf Wiedersehen, adieu. To you, to you, and to my ho too. And who will be next? Perhaps you? you? <laughs> <laughs> Bye, folks. <laughs>